Hi, and welcome to Focal Point AFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name. We'll continue to take uh, calls on your reaction to what we're learning about President Obama from Robert Gates' memoir. We'll take calls throughout the rest of this program. We're going to talk about some other topics, but if you want to cycle back to that, you are welcome to do that. 888-589-8840. You know, Charles Krauthammer, and this is a pretty sane guy. He's a pretty sober guy. Not given to rants or rhetorical flights of fancy. And uh, he says about Obama sending our troops into Afghanistan when he does not believe in the mission, doesn't believe in Petraeus. He says, how can a commander in chief in good conscience do that? Uh, So this is uh, Charles Krauthammer. He says this is an indictment. It's a shocking revelation. It's an indictment of the president that rises above anything else, everything else he's done in his presidency. In other words, Charles Cranmer says, look, this is the most searing indictment that possibly could be made of a sitting president. I mean, you think of all of the things that President Obama has done in his presidency that merit criticism, even condemnation, And the list is long. We could spend the rest of the day talking about the things that I believe represent his lawlessness, his contempt for the Constitution, his contempt for the rule of law, and and all of that, his, his, his hubris, his arrogance, all that. We could spend all day talking about that. Charles Krauthammer is aware of that. He's talked, he's talked often about these things himself. And he says, look, this is in a class by itself. What President Obama has done here, because this is the flesh and blood, these are the lives of American citizens, American soldiers that are on the line. Uh, And he says, how in good conscience can a commander-in-chief do that? And see, what that does, that raises a question. I mean, it raises the question, does President Obama have a conscience? I mean, I think that is a valid question. Does he have a conscience. You know, one of the characteristics of people that are pathologically narcissistic is they simply have no, they have no conscience. They're, 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 they're incapable of guilt. They're incapable of shame. They are incapable of recognizing the difference between right and wrong. They're incapable of admitting that they are wrong because they do not have a conscience that can be pricked, that can be stirred, that can be wounded, that can be offended, that can be embarrassed that will criticize them of their own behavior. And, you know, so when Charles Krauthammer says, look, how can a commander-in-chief in good conscience do this? Then what Charles Krauthammer is doing, I'm not raising this question. Charles Krauthammer is raising this question. Basically, the question he's raising is, does this president have a conscience uh, at all? So that is uh, kind of what we're dealing with today, and we'll be glad to, uh, to take uh, more calls uh, from you in this hour Uh, on this uh, subject, and if you want to branch out, we'll talk about some other things uh, as well. In fact, why don't we grab a couple of phone calls while we are in the neighborhood. Uh, Let's go to Robert in Newport, North Carolina. Uh, Robert, Newport, uh, North Carolina, uh, thanks for calling. understand you've got some questions or concerns about this statue to the demon god in Oklahoma. Talk to me. Yeah, um, I was actually going to mention something to you yesterday. Yes, sir. Um, in, D- in Washington, D.C., there is a resurrection statue. Um, that basically, it was supposedly built by the Masons, and it's, the story behind it is that it symbolizes the resurrection of the Canaanite god Baal. Uh-huh. So while I am against the statue of the demon god, you know, there kind of has to be the point of... Um, to point uh, to point that one out as well as there's basically a statue of a demon god in our own capital. Yeah. Well, and and see what the the other issue here, Robert, and this would be sort of a greater concern to me right now at this point is that statue. And I'm not familiar with the statue that you're talking about, so I'm going to take your word for it. Um, but the difference here is that that statue would have been approved by the elected representatives of the American people. Somewhere along the way, Congress would have said, we think it's a good idea. We want to commission this statue. We want this statue erected somewhere. They, so our elected representatives would have made the decision 
to put that statue in that place. Now, my concern is here, uh, Robert, with this statue to a demon god, is that this decision is going to be made by a judge because it's absolutely clear to me that the elected officials in the state of Oklahoma, they don't want this thing anywhere in the state. If this decision is made as it should be by the elected representatives of the people, then there's no way in the world this statue gets put up anywhere in the state of Oklahoma. But my concern, I'll give you the last word here, Robert, my concern, specific concern in this situation is that this decision is not going to be made by the representatives of the people, but it's going to be imposed on them by a judge. Any any last comments? Well, uh, no, not really. Okay. But I, I'm just kind of, I was just kind of um, thinking about the way our country's going, and yeah. Yeah. All right, well, listen, I appreciate your call, uh, Robert. Uh, and, you know, Robert touching there on the influence of the Masons in early American history, I think it's been exaggerated. Uh, but there isn't any question that uh, Masons were not a good influence. The Masonic system of belief is really idolatrous. Uh, you get to the higher levels in the Masonic order, and you are taking oaths in the name of Baal, in the name of an Egyptian god that goes by the name of On, this kind of composite god, Jabalon, Yahweh, Baal, and On, all crammed into one name. So there's no question that uh, Masonic system itself is an idolatrous system. I'm not saying that everybody that's in the Masons is into idol worship. I'm not saying that. A lot of people get into the Masons in the early levels, and they don't know what happens when you get to the 33rd and, and as a degree. You, they don't know because that stuff is kept from them until they get to the place, until they're kind of locked into the whole uh, deal. So I want to be sure that I'm not. you understand I'm not generalizing about everybody who is in the Masonic movement. Let's go to Todd, Lafayette, Louisiana. Todd, welcome. What's on your mind? Can we grab Todd there? Yeah, yeah Todd, welcome. welcome. What's on your mind? Hey, good to, good to talk to you. I wanted to uh, touch on your point that you made when you and your wife were discussing the heartlessness and the struggle you were having for words for a president that would send uh, people into battle after discussing what Robert Gates said. And I wanted to remind you something that you know of. This is the only man that voted against giving health care to a baby that survives an abortion. That's a true fact. So his heartlessness was revealed before he ever was elected. And well, that's um, that's that's a it's profound just proof of what he is at at a root level. Yeah. Well, I appreciate Todd. That's I hadn't I hadn't thought about that, and that's a profound reminder. You know, and, and uh, what Todd is talking about is when President Obama was a state senator in Illinois, and to amplify what Todd is saying, he didn't do it just once, four different times. Four different times, President Obama either voted against or used his political influence to keep a bill from getting a vote that would have required medical care to be given to a baby that survived an abortion. President Obama wanted them abandoned thrown in the corner of a room and left to die. A newborn baby, an American citizen, a child, he wanted it to be left to die four times. He did that. So that may be all the evidence we need about where his heart's at.